Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 16th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, in a weekend op-ed, the Anchorage Daily News editorial board completely ignores the issue of who pays. The issue that ICER head, Ralph Townsend, told the working group earlier this month is the single most important issue around Alaska fiscal. Second, in the Commissioner of Revenue's appearance before the working group, the administration appears to join in the effort to push costs off on middle and lower income Alaska families. And third, our view of the long-term impact of the Superior Court's recent decision on the so-called reverse sweep. And now, let's join Michael. Well, let's take a look at, um, we got these three items, and I, I mean, we're going to have to squeeze these in, but we're going to start off with number one. Um, the ADN editorial board is showing, again, it is ignoring the consequences of who pays, again, talking about distributional analysis and everything else. Uh, let's uh, let's start off there. Well, I, maybe all three segments are going to meld into one giant who pays discussion. In, in some respects, who pays is is sort of becoming the theme that that spending cuts was back in the back in the last decade back in 2013 and 2014 i mean you and i were fairly lonely voices back then talking about we've got to focus on spending cuts spending cuts spending cuts we've got to get this budget under control and everybody was saying nah nah we don't need to worry about that we got plenty of time don't you know we're, we're fine we'll we, oil's going to go to a hundred dollars again you know production's going to rise to a million barrels again we're fine. Don't worry about that. And, you know, and look where we are now. Uh, we, we talked about spending cuts. People ignored it. And, and look where we are now. In some respects, who pays, I think, is the, the issue of who pays, I think, is, is the issue of the, of the 2020s that we're talking about a lot. People are ignoring, saying, don't worry about it. And, uh, and, and I think it's going to end us up in, in, in a similar spot if we keep ignoring it. I think we're gonna, it's going to end us up in a similar spot. Uh, uh, deeper into the decade, the ADN uh, an ADN editorial that ran uh, over the weekend, uh, and this is from the op-ed board. I think Andrew Jensen wrote it. It's, it looks like his style, um, but an ADN editorial that ran over the weekend. The headline is "Why Dunleavy's Big PFD Math Doesn't Doesn't Add Up," and basically the, the entire editorial ignores who pays. Uh, this is sort of the guts of it. Uh, this this section. Uh, that I'll read. Given that the sales tax realistically wouldn't pay for the full amount of, of Alaskans' dividends, all of the money collected would simply be traveling in a loop from Alaskans to the government and back with no multiplier effect or benefit to anyone except for the newly formed bureaucracy in charge of administ administering the tax itself. And if the t tax was collected with as few exemptions as possible, the benefit to poor families, poor Alaska uh, families, whom the governor has said is at the heart of his love for big PFDs, would be somewhere between minimal and non-existent, as essentially all of their purchases would be taxed, eating away the value of those big, big dividends throughout the year. That's not true. That statement is not true. And the reason it's not true is because of who pays. Uh, PFD cuts hit, hugely hit, middle and lower income Alaska families. I'm not a big fan of sales taxes um, for reasons that I've discussed before and reasons I'll discuss again. But sales taxes, although they are regressive and all they, they, though they do hit middle and lower income Alaska families, hit them much less 
than than PFD cuts. What Andrew is trying to get, or what the ADN editorial board is trying to convince you of there, is there's no reason to worry about PFD cuts. There's no reason to fix P, PFD cuts because all you do is is you you take money out of one. Every Alaskan would take money out of one pocket. Uh, or get money in one pocket and then take it out of the other to, to pay for the tax. Not true. Middle and lower income Alaska families would have much more left in their pockets as a result of having PFD, uh, as a result of reversing PFD cuts, pay, being paid the full PFD, and then, and then contributing, like every other Alaska family, contributing to the cost of government uh, through some form of tax. Middle and lower Alaska fam middle and lower income Alaska families under every tax form, every tax form other than PFD cuts, come out better uh, as a result of um, uh, as a result of of uh, of of that of that trade. In fact, if you use an income tax, um, eighty percent of Alaska families come out better. Um, if you use a flat tax, eighty percent of Alaskas come out better. If you use the sales tax, 60% of Alaskans uh, come out better, of Alaskan families come out better. What the, what the ADN editorial is, is a perfect example of is, is ignoring who pays, ignoring the distributional effects of all of these fiscal measures, and focusing instead on, uh, focusing instead on sort of the gross effect and just ignoring what's going on among, among families. So it's, I mean, what what you know if you buy into that reasoning and and Zach Fields yesterday had a Twitter post that did exactly the same thing. If you buy into that reasoning, uh, what you're gonna what we're gonna end up with it, later in the decade is a horribly unfair fiscal structure being funded on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts, increasing the divide between upper income families who are paying contributing virtually nothing toward the costs of government and middle and lower income Alaska families who are, who are bearing almost the full cost uh, of government as a result of using PFD cuts uh, to do it. So, I mean, I, we, we talked about who pays on the show last week um, and, and, you know, some uh, uh, have argued that who pays is sort of inconsequential. We don't need to focus on it. It's not really an element of fiscal policy. It is the core of fiscal policy and the ADN editorial is a perfect example of why that is, um, and I'm just I it it really it really brought home not not only not only did it bring home the importance of who pays reading this editorial not only did it bring home the importance of who pays but it really you know upset me because they're lying <laughs> right right <laughs> well it, it, you know as we watch this and as we see it goes on this is the one thing that seems to be. Uh, a common theme is that nobody really wants to look at how the impacts of this is. Even after ICER got up and talked about it again, it seems like nobody really wants it. None of this came out of the fiscal policy working group's recommendations or anything else. They didn't talk about this outside of that as well. Dunleavy's biggest problem is that he has people giving him very, very bad advice. Must have had a phone call with Pinocchio Wool. <laughs> well... I mean, that's the part of the problem is that the governor from the very beginning has surrounded himself with people, I think, that were pretty much kind of old guard people, people who wanted to do business as usual. And that's not what he was voted in for. Uh, Brad, am I am I wrong on that? No, I think I well, I mean, he, he's had different people working for him. Sure, uh, sure. Ben, ben Stevens at the beginning. Uh, well, Tuckerman Babcock at the beginning, but Ben Stevens is an advisor. And then Ben for a while, and now he's got uh, 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 Senator Stedman's former chief of staff, who's now his chief of staff, um, Randy Raro. So it's a, uh, I mean, he's had people, uh, uh, different people advising him. I, I think, I think, I, I think it's, I, I think the the challenge of the administration is it's too poll driven. They're 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 trying to trying to tack too much. To where we where they think the polls where they think Alaskans are by reading by reading the polls rather than say this is my philosophy this is how I'm going to govern this is the approach I'm going to take um, it's it's more 
well, this is where I this is where I think I'd like to go, but the polls tell me I ought to be over here and ought to not be talking about that that much, and and so I'm going to go over there for a while, and then the polls tell me I ought to be, you know, that that's a little dangerous to be talking about that, so I'm going to go back over on this side. We're not. We're. I mean, there's a there's a sort of a core philosophy that's underneath it, but it's but it's you know the the tactics are I think are poll driven, um, and and I you know. That's disappointing. I, he was elected. He was elected on his philosophy. He was elected on on I'm going to come in. I'm going to cut right. the cost of government. Right. And I'm going and I'm going to do this and and do that. And you know a, after 2009 that just all changed. Uh, rather than come back and say okay well you didn't didn't like all of those cuts, but let's you know we're going to keep cutting. We're gonna we're going to find ways to continue cutting rather than do that he came back and said yeah well that didn't work so i'm not going to do that anymore right um and we've sort of just sort of been floating wandering from pole to pole since yeah no i would agree with that i mean he went out there and sold it as he was on the election trail smaller more limited government uh you know a, a, a statutory pfd uh you know the the fixing of the crime bill i mean of all those things he only got the one thing passed and then immediately uh you know when he you know when he when he got his hand smacked in the cookie jar 2018 2019 trying to cut the size and scope of government and he's really never recovered from that initial hand slap from uh you know a group of basically special interests in alaska i mean he's never come back from that no, and I think part of what he's tacking to now is the top 20%. I mean, so he's pro PFD. All right, good. That's right. We're going to we're going to get some some distributional equity in the state. And then all of a sudden, it's well, I'm pro PFD, but I'm going to use sales taxes, <laughs> which which is sort of the, the top 20% fallback plan, right? Right, right, right. And so all of a sudden, it's uh, I'm I'm all the way over here. I'm with you. We're going to get distributional ex- equity. We're going to we're going to restore the PFD. And then all of a sudden, oop, the top twenty percent don't like me anymore. So, but then, but then we're going to use sales taxes as, right. as the way to collect revenue. Yeah, no, and and exactly. And then this comment again, which was so powerful that I, that I mean, again, I, I I want to read it again. He says it's been it was made clear by a number of groups in Alaska that they didn't necessarily care for large reductions. It was also been made clear to me by Alaskans that they're not necessarily sad about taxes. And I'm just thinking, who are you talking to? Because obviously the people on this program have a huge appetite for reductions and they are vehemently opposed to taxation of any kind. So who exactly are you surrounding yourself with? Yeah. Well, he's he, uh, he's surrounding himself by polls, <laughs> and and the polls say if you cut if you cut a lot, the the, the you know the, there's a large segment that doesn't like you anymore, so stop that. Uh, if you uh, if you cut the PFD, there's a segment that doesn't like you, so stop that. Uh, if you if you you know tax equitably, raise revenues equitably because you can't you're not going to cut spending. If you raise revenues equitably, oop, the top twenty percent don't like you, and that's the donor class. Right. And we're running for re-election governor. We need don't we need contributors. Right. Um, right. So okay, can't can't do that. <laughs> Moving on to number two, we see that the governor is kind of giving up on um, pushing the costs. Uh, to, you know, spreading it more equally and to more uh, equally distributed, uh, you know, uh, feeling the pain, I guess, is what we're saying across everything here. His comments in this last section when it announced that he's going to be running for re-election, to me, is one of the most stark and startling things that I've ever heard the governor see- say. He said it was made clear by a number of groups of Alaskans that they didn't necessarily care for large reductions. It's also been made clear to me by Alaskans that they're not necessarily sad about taxes. And this is his comment as he files for re-election. This is number two. Move on here. Well, yeah. So the governor, the governor is sort of going in circles. It's hard to figure out where he is at any given moment. I mean, last week we were talking about the fact the governor finally had crossed the Rubicon and was talking about the need for new revenues. And we were talking about the fact that his revenue commissioner had come before the working group and was talking about revenues and had, had all sorts of, had all sorts of revenue options uh, for the, for the group to consider. Um, and then yesterday in a, in a press conference, the governor seemed to just entirely back up on that. 
Uh, well, first of it, first off, in his in his interview last week, where he announced his reelection campaign, and then in his press conference yesterday, he seemed entirely to go in reverse and say, "No, we don't need new revenues. We're going to be fine. Uh, we just have to, you know, take money out of the out of the ERA uh, uh, to transition, and then we'll be fine." Well. I mean, what he's talking about is transitioning to this fictional future that they've created with high oil prices and and, and significantly higher production volumes. Uh, that's not going to occur. Uh, but but you know he's 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 sort of he's sort of backed off from from where he was. The 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 thing he's the the thing that's cons- that's consistent among those statements though is um, is is the fact he's not he doesn't seem to be pressing for spending cuts anymore um, in the um, in the in the revised uh, fiscal plan that Department of Revenue put on the table to the to the fiscal policy working group, the the, the deep spending cuts that he had talked about previously uh, disappeared, um, and and spending levels were were capped essentially at inflation uh, going forward. Uh, and then in this statement, when he was announcing that he in the a, in the uh, APRN. Uh, uh, interview where he was announcing that he was running for re-election. It, uh, the sentence is it's clear by a number of groups of Alaskans that they don't necessarily care for large reductions, um, and um, and he's he's bought into that. The the um, the, the second the, the second thing though about the, that's really concerning about the governor um, is is his to the extent he has a revenue proposal and and to go back to the revenue proposal that. That, that his revenue commissioner trotted out before the fiscal group, it's a sales tax. And and again, let's go to the who pays. Who pays a sales tax are middle and lower income Alaska families. Now it's not as is not as tilted, not as regressive as PFD cuts. So there's some improvement there, but it still pushes the burden largely to middle and lower income Alaska families to some degree. The governor, you know, out of one side of his mouth is saying, I'm against PFD cuts because they're so unfair uh, to Alaska families. And then out of the other side of his mouth says, but my solution is 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 revenues that 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 take the largest share from middle and lower income Alaska families. It's it's just it, it, it's not a clear, consistent, uh, consistent, certainly not a consistent uh, message on either side. So it's just it, the, the governor's just just being very confusing uh, in in what he's saying, uh, both in terms of spending cuts, in terms of in terms of where we're going as a fiscal plan, in terms of the need for new revenues, uh, and and now uh, when he's talking about new revenues, at least, or when his revenue commissioner is talking about new revenues, talking about revenue measures that still uh, unfairly and, and disproportionately burden middle and lower income Alaska families. Well, and this has been the this has been the challenge from the very beginning is that this is where they this is where they always end up at is again kind of burdening it on everybody. Um, let's talk for a second as we I mean again we're seeing the governor uh, make this decision. What uh, what is your thoughts on the fiscal policy working group's recommendation that came out this four page document that kind of lines out some of the things? But I mean I don't know. You know, I mean, I guess disappointment. I, I was prepared to be disappointed, um, but definitely coming across this thing, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like this was the answer that we were looking for coming out of the fiscal policy working group. Well, I will say this, Michael. I was I was heartened by the discussion of of at least the discussion of fifty fifty of POMV fifty fifty. Right. Um, it, it. I mean, it to have. The eight people involved in that committee all talk about working toward POMV 5050. Uh, Jesse Keel, who's voted for uh, PFD cuts uh, consistently along the way, Calvin Schrage, who uh, you know voted for voted in committee for a bill that would uh, that would adopt the von Imhoff approach of uh, um, Kelly Merrick approach of uh, cutting PFDs to to $500 permanently. Uh, having those people. Um, agree that they're working toward POMV 5050. Uh, I thought was an improvement. Uh, was was it was a good thing? But the the thing about the the thing about the working group report is the same thing. It, this the, the big problem I have about the working group report is the same problem I have with the ADN inter- editorial. There's no mention of who pays of the who pays issue. Right. And right. The who pays issue is key not only to distributional equity among all Alaska families. But it's also key to the economic impact. 
I mean, the more regressive the tax, the larger the adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy because you're taking money out of out of the hands of people who would spend it. And and the fact that the working group didn't even list that as a criteria, didn't even list that as a as a as a matter of, of, of concern to them indicates to me that they weren't thinking about Alaska families and about the overall Alaska economy. They were thinking about something else. Right. Uh, and that's and that to me is very disappointing. We've gotten through, I don't know, one and a half. We're still on the second half of number two, which includes a discussion on the Fiscal Policy Working Group uh, report, which came out, which, I mean, I mean, it's got some good, I mean, it's got some good things in it for sure. Um, Talking about constitutionally protecting the permanent fund, although they give themselves an out by saying it could be as provided by law, leaving the formula in statute or... Uh, constitutionalizing it. It's got the discussion of the P of the 5050 uh, plan, 5050 POMV plan, but it also talks about fundamentally changing the constitutional budget reserve, which I think would eliminate the $10 billion owed to it. And then also the possibility of, re- of eliminating the reverse sweep. Brad, uh, your continuing thoughts here on the uh, w- working group's uh, report here. No, Michael, the debt to the CBR is $16 billion. $16 it's, it's billion. Not- yeah. Well, <laughs> it's not. God, I wish it was only ten billion dollars. Right. That, mean, that means we'd have some left. But uh, yeah, it's it's the 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 debt to the CBR is huge. And yes, uh, I read this the same way that uh, the proposal essentially is to uh, is to wipe that out. Um, take for this, and, and that's you know that's that's intergenerational equity. Take for this generation the benefit of you know not having to pay revenues and continuing to have government. To the by by drawing on 16 billion dollars in savings, um, and then once we did that, just sort of writing off that debt and telling future generations, eh, you don't have any savings. Um, uh, good luck. Good luck if you uh, when you win, not if, but when you hit your fiscal crisis, uh, we're not leaving you anything in the kitty. We've taken it all for ourselves. Um, and I think that's just I, I, from an energe- from from uh, being fair to our kids and grandkids. I think that's just that's just horrible. Uh, that that we would think about doing that, right. but there are there are things in the working group like you know the the POMB fifty fifty that I think that I think is a positive. One thing one thing that I that is really I mean the governor's press conference yesterday I still haven't fully absorbed and gotten my head around what's going on here, but the but the conclusion is um, the 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 working group believes the legislature must pass a comprehensive solution. Working group members do not support addressing only one or two issues to the exclusion of others. The working group believes addressing these issues as a comprehensive solution solves not only a fiscal challenge, but a political challenge as well. So their 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 proposal is we got to do this all at once. And then yesterday in his press conference, the governor says, nope, you got to do PFDs first. <laughs> and, then, right, and then we'll get right. to that. Uh, then we'll get to that other stuff. Um, and so as a, it's just the the, the dissonance. Uh, of of the governor's statements, not only not only compared to the working group, compared to his statements that the deal that his revenue commissioner made the week before, I, it's just I don't know what he's doing, and and it's and and the confusion I think um, is just going to cause uh, gridlock uh, if uh, if if we're not if, if if at least if we're not on the all on the same page of trying to solve all of the problems that that we're facing all of the fiscal problems in one comprehensive package if we're not all on the same page of that i think we're just going to lock up uh in in solving any of it uh and potentially end up this year with a zero pfd because we just you know we we can't even agree on what the process is to get to a solution well and right now there is no bill in the special session call there's nothing on the pfd there so is he expecting them to put something forward does he have to put something forward i mean what what's going on with that i mean there is no bill specifically and since he's vetoed it it has to come out of somewhere is he does he plan on that or did he did any indication yesterday from the press conference as to where he's going with that well the press conference seemed to seem to leave one with the impression that he's insisting on making a permanent solution to the pfd before we do any permanent solution to the pfd spending cap on the constitutional provisions before we do anything else so Presumably, what he's thinking is, if we can get to a permanent solution on the PFD, then the back end of the special session will adopt whatever that permanent solution is 
for for this year. He'll give he'll he'll put forward a bill at that point. But the problem is, as the as the as the working group itself, all eight of them, this says unanimous, uh, as eight of them recognize, you got to you gotta play with all the parts at once in order in order to have a solution. And so insisting that only part of you 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 agree to part of it before you deal with the rest of it, um, I think is a starter. Uh, and um, and and you know, and if and if he holds to the position he took yesterday which is we have to have a PFD constitutional amendment before we do anything else. The legislature and the legislature, the working group's telling us we're not going to have a PFD constitutional amendment if we can't do it all at once. Um, you get to the end of the special session. He's not gotten his PFD amendment. Right. He hasn't, as a result, offered a PFD bill. And we're, and we're at the end of the special session with the zero PFD. Which, again, is... <laughs> Just another, I think, another, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, point where Dunleavy has again kind of lost the momentum and lost the 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 uh, the the long term vision of what's going on. Number three, which was this discussion on the court's uh, reversal of the PCE in the reverse sweep, and the governor has now decided that he's not going to uh, he's not going to appeal that, which. Wow, I mean, we've got a real problem here uh, because this basically this decision cuts directly at the heart of what the Constitution says for dedicated funds, and uh, it's you know it it's a it's a tough thing for sure. It is. In any other week, this would be our number one. We would spend most of the program talking about it, but because of what else is going on, it's been fit into number three. The, the the problem with the with the court's decision is it gives the legislature a huge amount of power in terms of socking away uh, little discrete funds uh, and and having them bypass the CBR, having them bypass general savings, so that so that when we get to the next fiscal crisis, you've got no general savings. You, you potentially have no general savings you can go to. You just got a lot of these little funds like the PCE. And other funds that the court, that, that the superior court has said are okay, and when you get to the next fiscal crisis, you got nothing you can go tap. You're going to have to get into bargaining with constituencies that are protecting their micro funds and try to get them to contribute to the overall solution. But that's just going to be a mess. So, one of the geniuses I think of the Alaska Constitution is there are no dedicated funds. Each generation. Uh, outside of what the Constitution provides. Each generation decides what's best for them, what best suits them. Um, and this decision, I think, uh, this decision uh, cuts against that by saying, well, the legislature, even though you can't have dedicated funds, the, the legislature can create those these micro funds that, uh, that the governor can't essentially get at or the governor can't move back into the, into the, into general savings. They can all sit out there uh, in these micro funds. We don't actually know that's the law, though. One, one of the problems is by not appealing the decision is it's, is it's not going to go to the Supreme Court right now. So you've got a superior court decision uh, uh, that says you can create these micro funds. Um, and and we don't know that that's the ultimate law because we haven't asked the Supreme Court on what the ultimate law is. I suspect we get back there. Uh, by by a, an appeal on one of the other micro funds that's been created, the college scholarship fund, the whammy fund, one of these one of these other funds that sit out there. Right. I suspect we're going to have an appeal of that. But right now we don't we don't know that that's the law, the ultimate law. Uh, we're just going to the superior court is is going to have us follow. We're going to be following the superior court uh, decision until uh, until we get to the Supreme Court on another issue. Right. Well, I mean, essentially, you know, if you want to create a dedicated fund in this state, all you have to do is create a state corporation and silo the money out, and there you go. Now you could have a billion dollars sitting somewhere else that couldn't be touched by anybody else, and I think that definitely flies right in the face of what the framers of the intention of the uh, of the Constitution intended, for sure. Yeah, and it's really it's inconsistent with what they did on the. You remember the oil tax funds, right. the oil tax bonds. When they try to create the special corporation for the oil tax bonds, right, right, no, it's it's in, inconsistent with that. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I mean, that was one of the reasons why they said you couldn't do that, um, and yet here we are on the. As I look at this, I, I mean, I I see the governor is the one, in my opinion, with all the things that are going on, the governor is making a lot of mistakes.
And um, this, you know, if if we had had strong leadership from the beginning, if he had held the line from 2019 after the first, uh, you know, after the first budget came out and everything else and had not recoiled. And as you said, try to triangulate all his decision making based on polls. Um, we could have had a whole there. This could be a whole different setup right here. We need a governor that is strong willed and willing to do, you know, if it is the one and done one term and done, then that's what it is. Uh, but we need somebody who's strong and can make those decisions, not based on polling, but on principle. Yeah, I agree with that, Michael. I, for me, I just want the governor from last week back. I mean, the governor, the, at least as articulated by his Department of Revenue uh, commissioner, uh, the governor was willing to contemplate uh, revenues. I didn't like the revenues that he was that he was contemplating, but at least he was willing to contemplate revenues. Um, and, and given that we're not going to make that he doesn't want to make spending cuts, that's that's what it takes to close the deal. Revenues is what it takes uh, to close the deal. And I thought, OK, we're going to argue a lot about about the type of revenues, but at least he's come to the party. At least he's come to the table. At least he's anted into the game and and all the pieces are sort of out there and maybe we can bring them all together. Sort of what the sort of what the working group said. Argue a lot about who pays argue a lot about adverse economic impacts of of his chosen revenue option but at least you know we're, we're closing in on on a comprehensive solution the governor the, the new governor the governor we got uh in uh, in his uh, uh announcement last week of that he's running again um uh, and now certainly with the press conference yesterday where he says nope we're not revenues aren't on the table don't need revenues uh, all we need to do is raid the ERA, uh, and we'll be fine. You know, we got we got high oil prices and we got high production out there at the back end of the decade. We're all we're all going to be fine. Uh, don't need revenues. I, that governor, I, you know, that's the governor of the week before last or or last month uh, when he was, you know, when when he was saying no revenues, no revenues, no. And 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 I was I was explaining why that was a problem. Last week's governor was 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 a positive development. This week's governor, we're going back to, <laughs> we're, we're going back to to last year, last month, and and it's just a mess. And as I say, if he sticks with that, we are we are headed for a situation where there's no PFD this year, no solution, no long term solution, no comprehensive plan, no PFD. And I that's you know, that's not entirely on him. The legislature's played is cer- certainly a big role in it, but but he's certainly a contributing factor in it. Uh, right. If that's uh, if that's where we if that's where we end up. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. I mean, I think that he's he's a big contributing factor in this. And if he had continued to push back on this uh, from 2018 to today, um, I think I think we'd be in a different position than we were uh, then. And this whole thing again with the courts deciding how the uh, you know how the legislature works and and uh, you know this thing on the uh, on the reverse sweep saying oh that there can be dedicated funds to me is such a blatant misreading of what the Constitution says. This could be something that kind of breaks the budget moving forward. If this is all they have to do is silo these different things out and could protect them in that way. This is it. This is going to be a real problem uh, moving forward over the next ten years. Yeah, it, it ties. It ties the hands. I mean, any given silo has to be enacted by law and has to be signed by the then current governor. But the problem is, it ties the hands of the next governor and the governor after that and the governor after that, so that when we hit the next fiscal crisis ten years down the road, that governor's hands are tied because all of the, the the previous legislatures and the previous governors have all have siloed all these different funds have have created all these micro funds and 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 no i don't think anybody's really thinking through what we're doing to future generations we've drained the cbr we're not now we're saying we're not going to pay it back uh, we're going to keep a we're going to keep a minimal uh, uh, right. working account so they're not going to get the benefit of that we're gonna we're we're now gonna create we're now gonna have the ability to create all these micro funds that will tie future governors' uh, hands when they hit uh, their their fiscal crisis. I don't think anybody's thinking through what happens ten years down the road. So as I say, you know we're back to 2013, different issues, but you and I are back to 2013. We're talking about issues now that people are just you know saying don't matter, don't worry about it, it'll be fine. Uh, but by the end of the decade, just like spending was when we talked about it in 2013, by the end of the decade, it was a it's a huge problem. 
we're now creating the problems that by the end of this decade, maybe I won't be talking about them anymore, but, but you right. still will be Yeah. by the end, by the end of this decade, uh, will be huge problems again. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think that this is setting us up for, I think this is setting us up for ultimate failure and refusing to address this, refusing to, refusing to appeal this leaves that hole there. And I think that that's a problem. Uh, I mean, I yeah, think I, that's, that's the big problem. That that's a that's another poll driven decision. He didn't want to challenge PCE. I mean, the reason that there's no appeal is because he wanted the PCE uh, to stay there. He didn't want to take a hit from the Bush and the Bush legislatures and all those who align with them over PCE. So he just decided to take a pass on the appeal because of PCE. But it just leaves a big constitutional issue uh, uh, going forward for future generations. Yep, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. Final thoughts here, Brad, about 40 seconds. It'll be interesting to see this week um, what happens if the governor sticks to uh, to what he said yesterday. Um, I think this I think this session could fall apart within a week uh, if the governor will will come off that sum and say, OK, comprehensive. I've read the working group report. We're going to do this comprehensively. Here's sort of a comprehensive plan going forward. Come back on revenues. Then uh, then I think we may may see some progress. But uh, this time next week, you and I may be talking about the end of the special session. Uh, rather than uh, rather than steps that that, that it's made in uh, in getting this problem solved. Brad, thanks so much for coming on board and joining us. I appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.